How many here consider yourselves artists? Do we have anybody, any artists you enjoy creating or painting, writing, poetry, photography, architecture, sculpture, textiles? Do we have any sewers among us? Tile work? How many of you, we have some who've raised their hands. All you children should be raising your hands. I've seen your work. How many of you enjoy experiencing art? Enjoy seeing beautiful things, well-made things, things that you've been moved by. Maybe it was a photo or a painting or a sculpture or a story. Now the question. How many people believe that art, making art, experiencing art, wrestling with art, is an essential part of the Christian walk? Hmm. Some of us may be sure, and some of us might not know quite as much. We don't preach that often on art or creating it together, but we are in the second part of a two-week series called Create Together, Practicing Faith, Create Together. Last week, we spoke about the fact that God didn't just create a functional world. God created a beautiful world. Amen? And last week, we spoke about the power of music to move us and to be part of our Christian experience. Today, I want to wrestle with the question of art. What role does art have to play in our lives? We engage with it all the time. It might be pictures that we see or movies that we watch or TV shows or ads or things that we see around us, comic books, TikTok videos, decorations. Somebody is creating something. And so what role does it have in our lives? How do we discern how we should engage with the arts? What are they? Do we embrace them all? Do we reject them all? Are they superfluous, essential? Is there such a thing as bad art? And how do we decide? Is there a theology of the arts that can help guide us as we wrestle with this question today? Practicing faith, creating together, and creating art. So as we wrestle, I want to start this morning by showing you two pictures of different types of art. And the first one can be found right now in the British Museum. It is a piece of art called the Tree of Life. And I'm curious, you don't necessarily have to to say it out loud, although you can if you want to, but what is your initial reaction to the tree of life. Simple? It's not very green? When you think of the tree of life, maybe this isn't the image that comes to mind initially when you think of the tree of life. It can be hard to know exactly what it's made from, even. I'm going to show you a different, a close-up of the Tree of Life, and then give you a little bit of the context. This is what it's made from, the Tree of Life. And if you can't quite tell, the Tree of Life was commissioned for the African galleries at the British Museum and grew out of a collaboration between Christian Aid, the British Museum, the Christian Council of Mozambique, and four artists from Mozambique working in something called the TAE, or transforming arms into tools. Almost immediately after the armed struggle for independence in Mozambique that that lasted until 1975, the country of Mozambique, which is in southern Africa, my my family actually drove through Mozambique during this period, it, it dissolved into a civil war. The country of Mozambique was used as a pawn in the global Cold War. And so major countries from around the globe were pouring guns into Mozambique. Millions and millions of guns. And uh, although the war ended in 1992, these weapons were hidden everywhere 
under bushes and trees in the ground. People kept on stumbling upon weapons of war. And so Mozambicans were encouraged as part of this process to hand over their weapons in exchange for plows and bicycles and sewing machines. And their weapons, guns, were cut up and recycled and made into art, a tree of life. The tree of life is a war memorial in one sense, but it's ultimately a celebration of the courage of the people of Mozambique, many of them unarmed women and children who stood up and triumphed over the culture of violence. A bishop set up this thing called swords into plowshares. Do you, do you recognize that language from Isaiah? And the Lord will turn the swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, Isaiah 2, verse 4. Knowing this background, is there any change in your perception of this work of art? Does it feel different a little bit? Christians were involved in commissioning this piece, this tree of life, where weapons were broken down and rebuilt into something. Do you think the Christians that were involved in the commissioning of this piece, do you think it was a good use of their time and their resources? Did it help illuminate the gospel in powerful and important ways? Does it say something about God? this piece of art? Does it point to crucial biblical themes of redemption and restoration and salvation and hope? Is it a waste of resources where we should be doing something else? Or is it a profound and important witness? Wrestling with art. Here is the second picture. Does anyone know where this is? This is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and I remember visiting this cathedral when I was 18. I was spending a summer traveling around in Rome with a friend of mine, in, in Italy, um, actually in Europe in general, and, and I spent my 18th birthday in Rome. And I remember walking into this huge cathedral, and I walk in these massive doors, and I barely make it five feet in, and I just stop and look up, and I am awestruck. It is huge. It is filled with gold. It is filled with artworks and marbles. It is filled with light. It is filled with sculptures. It is incredible, awe-inspiring gorgeous. I spent probably half an hour just staring at a couple of, I would stop in front of one thing and just look at it and say, God, this is beautiful. The church's enormous size is not the only impressive thing about the building. In 1506 is when this was commissioned and it took a hundred and over a hundred years to make it. It finished in 1615. And during that time, they commissioned the best artists, the best sculptures, the best architects, to make something glorious. Unfortunately, if your first instinct with this picture is, oh, how beautiful, there is also a backstory to this basilica. In his zeal to complete this beautiful, gorgeous work of art, the Pope at that time, Pope Leo X, decided that they needed money. And so the way they would raise money to build this was that anyone who contributed to the cathedral would be granted an indulgence. We might not here as Protestants be very familiar with indulgences, but at the time, an indulgence was a piece of paper you could receive from a religious official, the Pope usually, that would say, that whatever sins you had committed, this is a very, a very generalized version, but whatever sins you committed could be forgiven because of your donation. There was even a very zealous man by the name of John Tetzel 
who had indulgence selling down to an art. He coined a phrase. He was, a, he was an advertising man. He coined a phrase that would say the following. When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. You could literally pay your way out of judgment. This practice of selling forgiveness for your sins, which is what the cr critics would accuse the church of doing, those who were in favor of it said, no, it's more complicated. But the critics would say, what you're doing actually is you're saying you want to raise money to build something beautiful. And so the way that you're going to do that is to say, if you've committed a sin, pay us and you'll be forgiven. And it was these excesses of indulgences that actually made a man named Martin Luther so angry that he said, we need to revisit what the church is all about. The challenge of art gone wrong. Beautiful. Knowing this backstory, is there any difference in your reaction to this work of art? Christians were involved in the commissioning of this piece. Do you think it was a good use of their time and resources? It's hard. It helps illuminate things. It says something about God. Does it point to crucial biblical themes? Is it good art? Is it bad art? Is it good theology? Is it bad theology? Church family, we don't often hear sermons about art or creating art for a reason because it is complicated and we have to have discernment and there isn't a simple one answer fits all at all times. It is an ongoing conversation. On the one hand are those who advise us to spend too much time thinking about the arts or spending money on the arts and they point to its dangers, dangers like one meme on social media that says, vow of poverty, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> if we say that what is most important to service is, is this really the space that we should be creating and looking at? And yet on the other hand, even though there are dangers with art, we can focus on the wrong thing. We could create bad art. We could, we could have corrupt ways of making art, we could make art into idolatry. There are challenges with art. And yet, there was a saying that in the 16th century, the reformers would quote from Latin, and I apologize to my translators, I'll say it in Latin and then I'll say it in English and you can translate it to whichever language you're doing. The Latin is, abusus non tolit usum which means the possibility of abuse does not remove the legitimacy of use. Just because something can be abused doesn't mean there isn't a good and real and valuable and proper use for it. While there can be bad art promoting bad theology, there can also be good art pointing to beautiful theology. Should Christians care about art? Should we seek to have beautiful things in the church, in our homes? Should we celebrate the gift of artists and have a place for their paintings and their sculptures and their textiles and their crafts? Well, let us turn to scripture and see what the Bible has to say. And we're going to start in the very beginning. Because I would argue that in the beginning, the very beginning of the Bible, we have these words. In the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. And if you look at the pictures, just a little glimpse of the pictures of this earth, would you say that God is an artist? Did God create beautiful things? A God who could have given us a gray world of just flat land, created a colorful world of mountains and forests and oceans, 
waterfalls and tunnels and beauty. In the beginning, God created. It is one of the first introductions we get towards God. Who is God? God is the creator. If you read the end of the book of Job, there is a whole passage that God says, were you there? Were you there when I created, when I, when I made the heavens, when I, when I set the fish upon the path in the rivers? Were you there when I made all of these things? God did not just create a functional world. God created a beautiful world, and we see it. I love this picture. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And if you look at those stars kind of carefully, do you see? They're not just stars. They are, if you look at the bottom, you can see. A thumb, do you see a thumb? It's a piece of art here. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Do you see hands in the stars? Scripture is full of proclaiming our God as a master artist. And in Isaiah 64, verse 8, we hear the words, You, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. God is a master artist. And God calls artists. And I'm going to argue that God calls artists to do two things. God calls artists to make useful things beautiful, and God calls artists to make beautiful things meaningful. So let's start with the first, making useful things beautiful. We're going to spend a little bit more time in this passage, so if you'd like to turn to it yourselves, we're going to be reading Exodus verse 35. The book of Exodus chapter 35, I apologize. The book of Exodus chapter 35 in verse 10, it says, All you who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. In this passage in Exodus 35, the children of Israel have just experienced the mighty saving works of God. And then God invites them to make something to continue that experience, to help remind them of what God has done and what God will continue to do. If you've been reading through the sabbath school quarterly this week was the sanctuary and this passage is the beginning of the instructions of building the sanctuary the lord says all you who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the lord has commanded then the moses said to the israelites see the lord has chosen bezalel son of uri the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom and with understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. We know the name of Moses, the one that God chose to help liberate and lead the Israelites but God called Bezalel to help create an environment that the Israelites worshipped in and through and with for centuries. And God said, I want you to make this with skill and art. He gave particular instructions. And he has given both him and Ohaleab, son of Ahisamak, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as engravers and designers and embroiders in blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen and weavers, all of them skilled workers and designers. Church family, I sometimes find that in a church community, we have an easy time finding a place for our singers or our pianists. But maybe God has given you the gift of painting or sewing or tile work. And you wonder, I love this, but has God called me to use it as part of my Christian walk, my Christian life? God certainly did call Bezalel. 
And God certainly did call Aholiab. And God certainly is calling each one of us. There's an artistic rendering of God inhabiting the sanctuary. The one that was built so carefully to remind the Israelites that God was present among them. People who made useful things beautiful and beautiful things meaningful. The artists, the craftsmen. There's another story that connects with this idea of not just art for the sake of making something that you use beautiful, but but the difference between beautiful art and meaningful art. And I invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. The book of Matthew, flip all the way over to your New Testament, chapter 26. It's an unusual story to use in a sermon about creative arts, but I'll, I'll share with you why it came to mind in just a moment. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. I want to pause here just for a moment and take a look at that alabaster jar. It was an expensive alabaster jar of expensive perfume. And in this day and age, nobody could just go to the store and buy a machine-made jar. Somebody crafted this. Somebody worked on this. Somebody lovingly created something beautiful. Somebody worked on the perfume, putting different scents together, trying to create a scent that would be uplifting. What if we consider Mary coming to Jesus with a work of art? Beautiful. But then it is what she does with it that makes it meaningful. Aware of this, Jesus says to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. She had a piece of art. It was beautiful, but contained in its jar, it was just that beautiful. What made it meaningful is what she did with it. It was art in the service of Jesus. It had depth and profundity. It was not superficial. It was not sentimental. Art that proclaims the gospel isn't just art that makes us comfortable or art that makes us smile. Art that proclaims the gospel takes note of humanity's brokenness, but also God's glory. Amen? Art in service of the gospel helps us experience something that mere words may not. If I were to tell you, Mary washed the feet of Jesus, those are words. If you were to look at the picture of one artist's rendition of Mary washing the feet of Jesus... What comes to mind? Do you get a different experience? Do you get a sense of her heart in a different way? God calls artists to make useful things beautiful and to make beautiful things meaningful. There is much more to say about this topic 
But why I'm bringing it up is because you might notice around our church community that there are moments and things that we're doing to try and make useful things beautiful and to try and make beautiful things meaningful. In the far left, we have some of our own church members who do worked hard to make a bathroom, which is useful, a little bit more beautiful. If you go down to the fellowship hall, you'll notice that the ladies' bathroom has been done by people with skills in tiling, and we thank them for using that gift for this church community. We have artwork that you'll see in the parents' room there that was done by somebody in our community painting pictures of the animals and the God's creation for our kids. We have one of our young adults who is here, I think, who helped paint the love first picture in our office. We have children's art. We have some, there's a blanket down there in the bottom corner. We have some people who are able to knit and create beautiful pieces of textile art. We have card makers. We have landscapers. If you are somebody who has been given the gift of creating beauty. It is a gift to be used, not abused, but to be used for God's glory. And we're inviting you, please let us know. We would love to be in conversation with you about how God might want to use you and engage how your perspective of seeing things in different ways might help our whole church family. Making useful things beautiful, making beautiful things meaningful, not just simple, but things that confront us and remind us of redemption and restoration and salvation. Art is many things. It is painting, it is pottery, it is textiles, it is storytelling. If you're a creative writer, if you are somebody who likes to write poetry, but it is also in this day and age, art also includes photography and videography. Every choice that you make when you make an edit is an artistic choice. So we want to say an invitation. If you are an artist, we want to encourage you. If you know an artist, we want you to encourage them. But I want to end, um, well, we've got a little bit of ways to go, but I want to here towards the end, share a video with you. A couple weeks ago, we had some videographers here. They shot videos, they took pictures, and they used the medium of video and photography and storytelling to tell the story about how God has been moving in this church community. I sometimes try and tell the story from up here, but this was a group of people who came using the gifts that God gave them to tell the story of God's work here at the Paradise Valley Church in a new way. And so I want to share it here with you this morning, the story of how God is moving in this church right now. Number one, they are welcome in church. Number two, they're a diverse community of believers who love each other. And number three, Jesus is first in the ministry of the Paradise Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church. We love this church, and we want you to see Paradise Valley. I believe what makes people feel welcome here at Paradise Valley is the ability to just be who they are. We have options to be able to be a part of in Sabbath schools or small groups. Um, we have numerous language groups that meet, whether it be Haitian Creole, Spanish, English, Tagalog. And I love that when people come, they can find a, a space to be able to feel most comfortable in and to be able to um, worship in. I like the fact that it was very welcoming when I first came here. I didn't know anybody at first, but um, I got to know more people and it was just, it was a welcoming experience. I don't think you would be able to learn about God if it wasn't a friendly place. 
There are stories of people loving people in really profound ways here that I get blessed by and that I am amazed by, that I am learning from. There's people who know how to love well here that I am learning from in terms of hospitality, in terms of just opening up their arms to each other. So I, I think we're on the way because God is moving here. And I think many communities are on, on their way as long as they follow where God leads. They've been truly like a family. So they've been like my second parents. It's like a safe place for like those that are still in like, still transitioning to adulthood. Worship can be anywhere as long as there's like the people. And we're in National City, which is like a lot of diversity and we welcome, we do our best to welcome everyone since it's not just about like a certain like target audience. I feel like it's an urban church. A lot of Seventh-day Adventist churches here in California are embedded in the, um, in the suburbs. But here you serve such a different demographic. And that means, you know, you have different ethnicities and, and you know, you have the Tagalog class at me, so you have the Haitian group, you have this, but yet it all comes together. So let's get everyone in the community here that we could be that beacon of light where if you need something, you know to come to Paradise Valley. When I came here, my son and I, believe it or not, came on crutches. We, we had had a bad car accident. They parked our cars for us. It was like a ballet service and people were so kind. We just stayed because we fell in love with the members and how nice they were to us. They didn't know us, but they were just so kind and loving. Whatever they could do to help, they did. Around now, I worship with so many different people, so many different languages. That's not the norm. And I imagine what heaven will be like, all nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We have, it's like the United Nations here on Sabbath morning. There, there are interpreters here. I don't know how many languages are being interpreted, but quite a few. You're given the headset, and you can enjoy the entire service from beginning to end. There's a lot of different groups, but then we all come into the sanctuary. You can always learn things from others, right? You have to interact, you have to socialize. How can you appreciate another culture if you don't get to know them? I left the church and I just came back last year and um, this is where we fit in. We tried other churches, I tried lots of churches. But if you make the effort and get to know people, they're there for you. We are the same. We may have different colors, we may have different backgrounds, we grew up in a different country, speak a different language, different culture, but the needs of the individual is all the same. Whether they live in Middle East or they live in Asia or they live in Europe, the needs are the same. We also have Friendships for Hope, which helps um, refugees. As it helped my family because we're refugees as well. So um, a lot of um, those that are like new to the country and those that are also like willing in the community to help those that are new to the country. So it's very much diverse and a helping hand, I would say. They have a lot of unknown difficulties that they surrounded with. But when they come to an environment where they are accepted, when they are helped, when they know that this, in, this entity is there to help them, no matter what the cost is, we are there to help them, then they are attracted to that. And so you'll see it all over the church. You'll see these words, we love because he first loved us. And we now have people start to say that. Um, when somebody um, describes a moment in their community where they were able to reach out to somebody or serve somebody and they say, we love first, or we love because he first loved us, seeing that become part of the DNA of the church has been really exciting and special to me. I, I do think at the heart of the gospel is this idea that we are called to love first, but we can only do that because of a God who loved us first. Paradise Valley is a church where every week we like to talk about uh, how Jesus is our foundation, um, how he loves us, how we're able to trust in him, have confidence in him. I see Jesus as um, somebody that is real and that shows up for us and that guides me 
to abide in Him because that's something that is always so taught here is abiding in Him and in serving Him. And so I, I believe that, you know, we, there is such a strong sense of service um, in this church. So that's how I see Jesus. You know, I want to serve like, like He did or, or in whatever capacity. In a way, it kind of feels like you're at home, like there's no pressure when being here. You just feel comfortable because around the people because they're very welcoming and you feel the presence of God during worship and during the message. And I was up on the balcony and the Holy Spirit baptized me. I had made the decision to get rebaptized, and the Holy Spirit just, I was forgiven, I was saved, I was an innocent child again. Love is the center of everything, but it's so biblical, and it's so much about what the um, what Jesus preached. The door is open for everybody. Everybody, even uh, you speak any languages uh, you speak, uh, you can uh, you're welcome here. Is this church actually heaven on earth? No. We have, we have a long way to go. We are sinners, we are broken, we are fumbling. We are desperately in need of the grace of God. And it looks closer to that first John picture of a church that loves first, that is infused by the love of God, and that you come here and you're like, there's something here that reflects a type of love that I haven't experienced before. You see in this video God at work, but you also see those God has called with the gifts of art or videography or storytelling or photography that they have come together to share the gospel in a new way. We, something is happening here and you, church family, are called whatever your skills are, whatever your gifts are, whether you are any type of artist to help proclaim the gospel, to help us see our reality with new eyes, to help challenge us and confront us, to help comfort us, to help point to the restoration that God has in mind for all of us, to point to who we are and to who God is. God is calling each one of us to make useful things beautiful and to make beautiful things meaningful, and to point all of it towards our Lord. That all who are skilled give your gifts to the Lord. That all who are faithful share your gifts with the Lord. That all who would do something beautiful give your gifts to the Lord. To the Lord be the glory. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our creator, that you have created an incredibly beautiful world filled with art and light and color, but that you have shared that gift with so many of us. God, may we use those gifts for your glory. May we have the space and willingness to be confronted and challenged by art and artists to see things in a new way and to see you better. God, we place ourselves in your hands. We pray that you use us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath.